Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, 5 o'clock on se September 4th, 2018. And at this time, I'm going to call the County Board of Supervisors to order. And we will have our invocation, which is uh, Dr. Dawn Jeffries Ramstead, Hudson United Methodist Church. So everybody stand, please. Thank you for inviting me. I'm not only the pastor of Hudson, I'm the circuit leader of all the United Methodist Churches in St. Croix County. So I'm happy to see so many of you here tonight. And I will warn you in advance, I do stop talking so you can hear God. So I'll be done when I say amen. Okay? Let us pray. Lord of creation, this evening we pray together not in our sanctuaries, but here in our government building. It is not our hour for worship, but it is our hour for service. Our county supervisors are gathered to do the important work of neighbors, to care for each other, to protect the rights of all, and to make decisions for the common good. Other, others of us came to address our elected county board on issues of great concern affecting themselves and neighbors. We are mindful that these democratic privileges of assembly, voice, and vote are not always accorded to all people in all times. May our gratitude to you at being entrusted here and now with this great liberty make us mindful to use our precious blessing to do for our neighbors what we would want our neighbors to do for us. We ask you to be with our elected leaders both those we voted for and those we did not, as they do their best to foster community and respect in our country, and especially here in St. Croix County. Lord, help both the elected and the electorate hear the cry of the needy along with you and become your means of answering their cry. Open the hearts of all of us present to the needs of all our neighbors and not just the ones whose political signs agree with our own. We pray for balance between the blessings of a secure home and the right to freedom of assembly. Help us move beyond tolerating our neighbor to respecting our neighbor. Lord, we want so much to be worthy of our life with the blessings of democracy in a free nation. So many of the decisions made here in our county board have to do with land, Creator God. Make us mindful that while we are its stewards, you alone are the creator of this precious place where we now live. Please help us be worthy of your sacred trust. May our county supervisor's decisions be wise for our common good as well for, as for the common good of our children's children. Thank you for hearing this prayer. Speak to each of us in this silent pause and meet us in the evening ahead. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, I pray in his name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Everybody join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ready for roll call, Cindy? All present except for Roy Schoberg, and he is excused. Thank you. At this time, we're going to be open for public comment. I have a couple of cards here. And just a reminder, it'll be time for three minutes for public comment. And for anything for on and off the agenda. So we will start with uh, Julie Peterson. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm here tonight to represent the American Cancer Society and just I put a purple card at everybody's place 
And um, it's just to read, um, save the date card. This year, um, coming up in 2019, instead of having a divided relay, one in Hudson and one in New Richmond, there will be one St. Croix County relay, and that will take place in Hammond, which is a little more central to our county, and it will be at the Hammond, the St. Croix Central High School, so there's a little more space and uh, space for if there's inclement weather as well. So um, I just wanted to give all of you an update on that and hope that you will spread the word to your constituents um, to come and support the relay and um, in a new place and, in, and uh, at a new time. And so we hope that you all will join us and get the word out for us. Thank you. We have uh, Roland Ramos. Good evening. Um, my name is uh, Ron Ramos. I'm the commander for VFW Post 10818 in St. Croix County. Um, please forgive me if I speak fast. Just let me know. I am from New York. I'm not from Wisconsin. So if you can't understand me, just throw something. Um, September 14th, our post is putting together. I see it. <laughs> our post is putting together a suicide prevention and awareness forum. The month of September is uh, National Suicide Prevention Month. Um, so we are putting together a forum for the entire St. Croix County. It is not just related to veterans only. This is a problem that's specific to veterans, kids in school, the, um, the older demographic with the seniors, and just about every walk of life there is. So we are representing just about every demographic in this forum on this evening. Um, September the 14th is the end of National Suicide Prevention Week, which is dedicated to just that. Um, getting the information about resources out there for people struggling with mental health. Um, so we love, you know, if we get a good attendance out there, we're going to be uh, having quite a few uh, guest speakers, um, a lot of good information put out there, not only for the veterans, but for the students as well, for just about every walk of life, every profession there is. You know, we're here for you. We have the resources to make sure that everybody gets the help that they need. So that's what, um, that's what we have today. Hopefully everybody got a flyer. I'll be handing some out for you guys back there. Um, but that's all I have, unless anybody has any questions for me. Oh, sorry. This is my first time doing this. I do apologize. Okay. But that's all I have. Thank you guys very much for your, for your time. Thank you. This time we're still open for public comment for anything on or off the agenda if somebody wants to speak. We're still open for public comment if anybody wants to speak. Third time, we're still open for public comment. Not seeing any, we'll move forward with our agenda. Thank you. We'll move into our consent agenda. We have the minutes from previous meeting on August 7, 2018. The next meeting will be October 2, 2018 at 5 o'clock p.m. And then we've got uh, rezoning for the town of Hudson. CSM 215217, lot one, rezoning 3.0. 0.51 acres from commercial to commercial light industrial and uh, alterations to county supervisor district lines due to annexation. Need a motion to approve. Supervisor Coulter, second. Supervisor Long, any discussion on the consent agenda? Not seeing any. We're ready to vote on that once we get the motion second. So. That's all yeses, thank you. Uh, we have presentations and, and recognitions. So the first presentation is the 2017 audit report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to introduce uh, Brock Gian and his associate from Clifton Larson Allen, uh, who will be presenting the summary of the 2017 financial audit. Uh, Brock was uh, present at the last administration committee uh, meeting and he presented uh, his report to the administration committee in advance of tonight's presentation to the full board. Uh, the administration committee has copies of the financial reports, so we didn't put them at your workstation, but we did put them at the, 
the other county board supervisors at your workstation. So you should have copies of the report. It's also uh, posted on the county website in addition uh, to that. So the, you, can, you have access to it that way along with the public. And if you are not interested in keeping a hard copy of the report, just leave them at your workstation and uh, Ken Witt will collect them after uh, the county board meeting adjourns. So welcome back, Brock. Uh, the floor is yours. Good evening, thanks for having me. Um, uh, you know, as mentioned, I was here a couple weeks back and we went through uh, things in quite, quite detail at that point. So um, just keeping things really high level, just gonna cover a couple pages, point out a couple things that are pertinent to this full board here tonight. That being said, if you have any questions, if you had a chance to look at anything in advance or uh, whatnot, if you have questions as I go along, fire off, uh, just let me know. Um, likewise, if you think of it something afterwards, after I'm gone or whatever, you can circle that back with uh, finance and uh, I can get back to that point. So really just gonna keep point out a couple things that are key to your audit for 2017. So um, if you do, you should, if you were looking at the hard copies, you have three separate documents. Uh, I'm not sure which ones you have in front of you. Uh, the thickest one is your annual financial statement. Um, you have one that's called a federal and state single audit report. And then a uh, third one that's <coughs> the thinnest, that's the audit summary. And I'm gonna cover just the first couple pages on that one if you, if you wanted to follow along. It's also up here on the screen. Uh, this document covers all this uh, at a very high level, the summary of what you wanna hear from your auditor. So um, in particular here, uh, the first part covers the reports we've issued. Um, there's an audit opinion that's on the thickest, the annual financial statement. Uh, we've issued an unmodified opinion there. That's the highest level you can get. It means the amounts and, and disclosures are materially correct. Um, in addition to auditing the numbers though, we do look at your internal controls and we're required to test those as well. And we have two items that we report there. They're ongoing, uh, things you've dealt with in the past and you're currently working on uh, uh, trying to mitigate these risks as well. They're listed here as uh, 2017-001 and 002. Material audit adjustments simply means we as auditors, external from your internal control process, come in and we propose adjustments to your books. Uh, very common for us to do that, but again, we do that here, and if we do that, and it's a large enough of dollar amount, it ends up as a, what we call material weakness. The second one is limited segregation of duties, and um, probably have more to talk about on this one for your 2018 audit, only, only from the standpoint, as you, as you know, you implemented a new ERP system. So January 1st or so, you know, beginning of the year here, things change considerably for you, how you process things, how you report things. Um, so not a lot of change from, say, your 2016 audit to 2017 in that regard. Uh, we didn't find any problems associated. So when we audit your controls, we didn't find any fraud or error because of the situation. Uh, but there, you know, there are aspects of your control process that could use improvement. Um, and you're addressing a lot of those here with your new ERP system. So we'll evaluate that. Uh, in the 2018 audit and report on this uh, again next year for an update. In addition to internal controls, we also uh, test compliance. So you do um, have many grants that you run, as you're aware, here in the county, and uh, you are subject to certain contracts and whatnot. So we look at those as well, and we have no findings in, in regards to that. Uh, so there was no non-compliance. The rest of this page here, we do point out a couple things. These are mainly for finance. We talked through these things to work on. Uh, more more operational, so I won't go cover those today. And then uh, just a comment here below that you do have a nursing home audit. While it is incorporated into your annual financial statements, which you have in front of you, um, there is a separate standalone report with that as well, uh, but that received the same report in unmodified opinion, which is the highest level. Uh, now, the rest of this document, you'll find financial summary data for uh, each individual fund that the, uh, the county runs. I'm not gonna talk about all the, all the funds here tonight. Again, we covered all this in great detail. Um, I'm strictly gonna make my comments here on this first page on your general fund, the general operating fund for the county. Most people uh, you know, think of this as, as, your, as your, your main fund. Um, and certainly here's where we look to see the financial health of, your, of the county as well. So looking at this, a couple things stick out. Um, I tend to look at uh, what was your change in fund balance, this, this total fund balance change on this row here, if you can see where my pointer is on the screen. Uh, a little tough to read up there. But basically, you had a positive results of 1826000 for the year. The year before that, it was a negative $2.5 million, uh, 2 million. So some of that is timing of when expenditures hit, certainly, right, um, compared to when they were budgeted. But uh, when we look at um, 
your reserves for the year. This this fund balance section down here, and I know it's hard to tell, or maybe it's uh, hard to read here, but they are there are three shaded rows. This this one, this unassigned fund balance row of nineteen million three hundred thousand, that is what we consider your true reserves. We can compare this number then to uh, historically how it's trended, um, other counties in Northwest Wisconsin that we work with, and, and so forth. So. We take that number and we divide it by your expenses for the year. This row down here, second to the last, at 36.9 million, and we get that percentage at the bottom. And you'll see there's a pretty significant uptick this year. Um, it went to 52%. Now, to give you some perspective, the 11 counties we work with, the average is 48, 48%. So you're right in that ballpark. You were uh, fairly short of that in the prior year. Every county is a little different, though, so keep that in mind. And really, the big change here is uh, a couple things. Um, you did have positive results, which I mentioned here earlier, right? P positive results for the year. But really the biggest component is um, how you classify things. And this, I don't want to get into too much detail here, but if we go back up to your fund balance section, um, there's four different buckets of fund balance. And we just focused on your unassigned, your true reserves. Well, the reason that changed quite a bit from the prior year went um, from 14 million to 19, a, a big chunk of that is just uh, your sales tax fund. Okay. You, you track and you uh, track finances for your sales tax funds separately, and that transfers in uh, to support operations. Uh, for 2017, there was a change in where that wasn't considered its own bucket anymore. That wasn't assigned. That was rolled into your unassigned category, and that was the biggest chunk of the increase from 14 million to 19. So that's you know uh, inflated, if you will, your your percentage at, re at the bottom. But it is truly what it, it belongs. And starting in the new system here. Uh, it's been set up that way by default. It's not its own fund anymore. It's just part of the general fund, so it'll, it'll stay now in this unassigned category until you carve off dollars specifically for other assigned purposes. So hopefully that made some sense and you followed along, uh, but that is the reason for the change here in your trend. So overall, positive results for the general fund operationally and uh, your, the, the, the factors we monitor, the big one here on your percentages, is positive as well. Um, nothing really other than that outside of that we, we you know, want to point out and talk to you about tonight for your other funds, but um, certainly, like I said before, uh, happy to answer any questions if you have any. Are there any questions at this time? Not? Thank you very much. Yep. Pleasure. We'll move down to the recognition of Public Health Coordinator, Health Officer, Deb Linderman, and I'll turn that over. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, our Public Health Officer, Deb Linderman, uh, will be retiring uh, very soon, and uh, so we're going to uh, present Deb with a little recognition. Uh, but before I say anything, I wanted to uh, especially uh, recognize and introduce one of the, our guests this evening. Uh, we have with us uh, Tim Ringhand uh, from the state of Wisconsin. Uh, Tim is the regional director of the Division of Public Health Western Region, so he's our regional boss uh, from the state of Wisconsin when it comes to public health. Uh, so uh, Tim has worked closely with Deb and uh, I think it's pretty special that he made the trip over here this evening uh, to say a few words uh, about Deb Lindemann. Welcome, Tim. Well, thank you, Patrick, yeah. and thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, uh, I'm here representing the Department of Health Services and the Division of Public Health, as well as the Western Region Office um, today to recognize Deb and her work. Um, public health, and in public health, we have kind of an adage um, that uh, public health is doing its best job when you don't know anything about it. Um, with the work of public health is really in protecting um, folks from disease, and promoting health, and preventing diseases really from occurring. Um, and all those um, issues that public health um, provides here in the state really are provided um, uniquely in Wisconsin, not at the state level, but at the local level. Um, that's really board, local boards of health are really the the kind of the where public health is really provided in the state. And in each of those 87 jurisdictions around Wisconsin, boards of health hire health officers to really provide um, that wide and lead that wide range of services that need to be provided for um, each jurisdiction that they serve. And um, not only do we have to have people who are 
um, knowledgeable about um, environmental issues from food safety to immunizations, which a lot of people know about public health, but communicable disease control and prevention, as well as promoting um, health and preventing chronic diseases. Not only do they have to know about this, but we also call them officers for a reason, because they also have to enforce public health laws, um, whether it be animal bites or communicable disease laws. So this wide range of, of knowledge they need to know, and plus they need to be able to collaborate well with others to be able to actually enforce these laws at the local level. We ask a lot, um, really, of health officers. You ask a lot as boards. We ask a lot as the state jurisdictions ask a lot of these really 87 people around the state. And so that's why I'm really happy to have the opportunity to come here today to speak a little bit about one of these folks that um, is making a change um, with Deb. I've known um, Deb Lindemann since she was a public health nurse, really working in um, St. Croix County, and uh, I was working in the region um, as well, and have worked with her um, through the years, really, um, as she's developed as a, oh, a supervisor um, in public health, and then now as a health officer, really, at St. Croix County. Um, as I recall, when um, she first started here in St. Croix County, you were um, in the middle of your public health accreditation journey, and. Um, Deb came in the middle of all this. Um, that's a, uh, it was a new um, uh, process that you were all going through that really accreditation was new at, um, really was in public health. So her coming in and being able to lead that not, um, was really, um, uh, to me, right away spoke of her ability to be able to work with and collaborate with your staff, your leaders, and your community to really impact public health in St. Croix County. She's also been a leader in so many other ways, not only um, here in St. Croix County, but in the region. She's um, led our uh, regional uh, Wisconsin Association of Local Health Department and Boards um, regional group. She's been um, the chair of, uh, on the board of the local 5013C um, consortium that provides public health education to um, public health professionals around this region. So she's been impacting um, this region as well, and also the state. Um, she's been involved in preparedness activities, um, maternal child health um, work, um, as we've worked on policies around the state. And um, she's really impacted not only um, the, the local level, but regionally and state as well. So that is really the reason I am really happy and honored, really, to be here tonight to um, present um, not, um, this award or recognition um, to Deb of her um, 27 years in nursing practice um, and um, her many dedicated years uh, working in public health. So Deb, thank you very much. Thank you. Signed by um, the, the Division Department of Health Services um, Secretary um, uh, Linda uh, Steemeyer and uh, the Pro Division of Public Health Administrator Karen McCune. We all want to say thank you. Can't no, you can't talk yet, Deb. Right. <laughs> you can't. Uh, how do I follow that? Thank you, Tim. Uh, you said it all, but I did have a couple comments that Fred helped uh, this evening. Uh, Deb has been with us for over 15 years. Uh, she started uh, as a public health supervisor and finally, uh, in her current position, public health officer for St. Croix County. She was appointed to the public health officer position in January of 2013. For anyone who knows Deb, you know that she has a passion for public health. Uh, while Tim has uh, listed uh, greatly her accomplishments, uh, they, they have been many. Uh, two of the highlights that uh, Fred and I would like to uh, point out that Deb has led our local accreditation, which Tim spoke to, uh, with St. Croix County, and we are one of the first public health departments in Wisconsin to become nationally accredited. And Deb has also been a leader in the Healthier Together Coalition with our local hospital partners and Pierce County Health Department to complete our community health needs assessment plan, which some of you are very familiar with. These, both, both of these accomplishments and many others make what the the public health department in St. Croix County is all about. Deb has been an active member of her professional associations at the state level, which Tim pointed out. 
And these professional associations recognize Deb as the first recipient of the Florence Nightingale Award. And more recently, she received the Distinguished Service to Public Health Award. On behalf of the St. Croix County Board of Supervisors, Deb, and County Administration, we would like to also present to you this uh, certificate in our appreciation. Um, before I do, um, sometimes you say that certain employees cover the spectrum from A to Z, and Deb really was able to do that, literally, from Asian flu <laughs> to the Zika virus. <laughs> so she has covered it all, and I remember talking to her about some of these, these issues when uh, it was just coming out that, you know, jurisdictions had to be ready, um, and she was always on top of things. And so I knew that the public health of St. Croix County was very good hands under Deb and her leadership, Fred Johnson and his team. So Deb, in recognition and grateful appreciation for 20 years of loyal and dedicated service to St. Croix County, our sincere gratitude is extended to you this fourth day of September 2018, signed by myself, County Administrator, and uh, Fred Johnson, Director of Health and Human Services. Okay, I'll just say a few words. Um, I just wanted to mention though that when Ebola first came out, this is a credit to Pat Thompson, the administrator, he said to me one day, what are we doing about Ebola? And I thought, well, I don't think that's gonna come here, but <laughs> actually we needed to be prepared, so he kind of got me going there. So I always appreciated that and remember that. But I just wanted to thank everyone for the recognition. Um, I'm really very grateful to have been able to work in St. Croix County for 15 years as a public health nurse and then five years as the health officer. Um, I've always felt proud to work in St. Croix County because it's a very progressive county and I'm um, grateful that I work in a community also where um, there are many citizens and organizations who care about health and who really work together to um, work on improving the health of the community. I also wanna thank the full county board You've always been supportive of public health and I appreciate that over the years. Um, a special thank you to the HHS board also because you are the board of health and I've come to the board meetings more often than I'd like sometimes, but um, you've always been very, very supportive also of keeping me on my toes with good questions and really paying attention to what's going on and, I, and that's so important and I really appreciate that. I also wanna say um, a special thank you to the regional office, to Tim and all his staff because they've for their mentorship and their assistance and their expertise over the years. They've been very, very helpful and supportive. And then last of all, a special thank you to Fred. He's always been supportive and helpful, um, a good leader and um, good to public health. And then to Sharon as the public health supervisor because um, I could not have done this job without her and she knows that. And um, last but not least, I wanna say thank you to an outstanding public health staff their knowledge and their experience and their dedication has always made my job easier and is so much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you Deb. Uh, we'll move on to West Central Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission report from Lynn Nelson. Good evening, uh, my name is Lynn Nelson and I'm the Executive Director of the West Central Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission. I'm here tonight and I brought one of my staff members, Toby Lemahue, and we'd like to take just a few moments of your time to go over a couple of things. Um, I'm going to provide you with some information on the Regional Planning Commission, who we are, what we do, touch on a few of the projects that we've been working on in St. Croix County, and then Toby is going to provide you with an update on the Regional Business Fund. And the Regional Business Fund is an important regional revolving loan fund that provides gap financing for businesses. Um, it's a separate nonprofit organization, but it's administered by staff of the Regional Planning Commission. So Toby will provide you with an update on that. Um, I just want to note before we provide you some information is that there is a packet of information in front of you and it contains a variety of things. Um, the first one is this small folder 
which is a summary of some of the services that we offer. Quick and dirty look at what we do. Um, the second item is an overview of some of the projects that we worked on in St. Croix County or regionally that impacted St. Croix County for two, 2017. And that looks like this. And then finally, at least for the Regional Planning Commission piece, there's also a copy of our 2017 annual report. And that really focuses on a wide variety of projects that we worked on throughout the region. Often when we provide these updates, we just talk about the projects we've done in your county. But we started to learn that many times county board supervisors wanted to also hear what we were doing in other counties because there's overlap between our counties and some of the issues that we're deal helping other counties deal with might be things that you're looking at as well. So this gives you some good examples that you could look to for your neighbors as well. So that's when the, what's in the packet, business cards for Toby and I as well. So if you want to be in touch with us in the future, please do so. Um, so first, just a little bit of information on our organization. Uh, the West Central Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission is a multi-county planning organization that was created in 1971. Uh, we cover seven counties in West Central Wisconsin, including St. Croix, Polk, Barron, Chippewa, Dunn, Eau Claire, and Clark counties. We're governed by a 21-member board that's made of three representatives from each of our seven member counties. <laughs> Um, our current St. Croix County representatives include County Board Supervisors Dan Hansen and Judy Achterhoff, as well as I'd like to recognize outgoing representative Tom Coulter, who served on our board from 2016 until 2018. And our current third member is a citizen representative, and his name is Larry Weisenbeck. So I'd personally like to thank all of you for your contributions that you've provided and will provide to our organization as we move forward. In addition to our board of directors, we have a valuable staff made of 13 employees with degrees in planning, public administration, and finance. And they're really those people that are out in the field, in the communities, doing work day in and day out. So you probably are running into those types of people. Um, the overall goal of our organization is to provide units of government or assist them in, in planning for the physical, social, and economic development needs of the region. And we do that in three primary ways. We serve as a coordinating organization between federal and state agencies and the local units of government that they serve. Um, we also assist units of government when there's issues that occur at a regional level. And when we say a regional level, that can be it affects all seven of our counties at one time, or maybe a smaller uni uh, number of units of government, but where that issue crosses jurisdictions. And that's always a good time for us to step in and provide assistance. And then we also provide technical assistance, advice, and services directly to individual units of government under contract. Our services fall primarily into four categories, including economic development, transportation, community development, and mapping and um, natural resources. And there's many examples of the types of projects that we worked on over the past year in your packet, but just a few include, um, we worked on the St. Croix Valley Business Innovation Center in River Falls. Um, we assisted that group over, actually it took about the past 10 years in discussion, discussing what that facility could look like, um, how it could be staffed and organized. We assisted in securing funding through the Federal Economic Development Administration and then also with the Project Administration, making sure that they were adhering to all the state and federal re regulations. So that was an exciting project that's doing very well. Um, We've also assisted St. Croix County with a hazard mitigation plan update that's recently been completed and I believe it'll be coming before you for approval in the near future. And then um, a third example is we worked on the Hudson Safe Routes to School Plan. Many other things too that are listed in the project I want, or in your handouts, I won't go over them. But um, with that, I'd just like to thank all of you for your support and we look forward to working with you on future projects. If you have questions or there's anything you ever want to talk about, please give us a call. We're more than willing to come and meet with you or talk, talk by phone. So, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Toby who will provide you with an update on the Regional Business Fund. Thanks. Um, so I also have a few things in your, your packet there, and it's exclusively about the Regional Business Fund. So if you have other questions or um, 
in the future or now, we can answer them now, or you can contact us so the information is there. So I work on the contract that the Regional Planning Commission has with the nonprofit regional business fund, like Lynn said. We have the same seven counties that we serve, so what I'm talking that we have the same footprint. Um, and the Regional Business Fund is a nonprofit that offers low or no interest financing to businesses that provide an economic benefit to the region. And that could be um, by providing jobs or retaining jobs. Um, maybe they're revitalizing a building in the region's downtowns, adding new technology, um, increasing their tax, tax base with their project, um, or leveraging private capital investment. So we're kind of looking at it through that sort of lens when we're doing these business financing deals. So we can provide loan funds to businesses and they're very flexible. It can be used for working capital, leasehold improvements, acquisition of building, land, equipment, those sorts of things. Um, building renovations, site improvements, um, or leasehold improvements. So really any sort of fi business financing need we, we might be able to assist with. Um, and I do have all the information on the programs. I'm not gonna get into the weeds of the details of the programs to um, save you some time tonight, uh, but you can find our website on there, so feel free to look at that for full details. Um, since the consolidation of the Regional Business Fund 11 years ago, um, 11 years ago, our Regional Business Fund has assisted in St. Croix County alone, 125 businesses, including 42 startups, with over $9 million in financing, and the businesses have projected to create or retain 1,726 jobs in the county. Um, some recent projects include Say La Vie Bistro and Cafe Cottage, Rush River Brewing and Junior's Restaurant and Tap House in River Falls, Sematube On-Site Apparel and Beyond Behavior in Hudson, Dan's Custom Floors in Woodville, Spine Pro Chiropractic, The Press Room, Sweet Beat Bakery and Johnson Ford of New Richmond in New Richmond, and Refurbish Hounds and uh, Domino's in Somerset. Um, in closing, I'd just like to recognize the valuable contributions of St. Croix County residents. Uh, we have board members, um, and from St. Croix County, we have Barbara Butler and Dale Jorgensen that sit on our board of directors. Uh, we also have a St. Croix County Loan Committee that reviews and decisions all of the, most of the requests that come from the county. And those members include Jason Bast, Shane Bauer, Mark Benton, Susie Corum, Josh Linseth, Susan Lund, and Paul Wenzel. And then also a special, an extra special thanks to Bill Rubin, who also refers businesses our way a lot and, and calls a lot of resource meetings where we're included in on those. So thank you. Do you have any questions for Lynn or I? Sarah I don't, I don't have a question as much as I have a, a comment. And, and this is for people who may not be familiar with West Central Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission. We live in, an, in a time of consultancy where municipalities and county and, and businesses will turn to consultants readily and sometimes their first option and we have at our disposal an agency which is made up of consultant quality and sometimes superior to consultant quality experts and they're a lot less expensive and sometimes free and it's a great thing to recommend this agency to your municipalities school boards and businesses who are involved with your economic development uh, and, and not just because I'm a commissioner, a new commissioner, uh, but because I, I really believe in their mission. So I recommend them highly. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much, Lynn. I'll turn it over to Administrator Thompson for appointments. Yes, following up our, on our public health uh, discussion, um, in light of the fact that I tried to talk Deb into not retiring, um, she, she listened to me up until that point. She said, no, Pat, I'm going to retire. Um, so we had to, um, by state uh, statute, it requires uh, the appointment of an interim public health officer uh, so I know um, Deb mentioned Sharon Reiser in her comments. Uh, Sharon is a public health supervisor uh, in the public health office, and she's a long-term employee as well, and very capable of taking on this role on an interim assignment until we have a permanent uh, replacement uh, in place uh, for Deb Lindemann. So at this point, I would like to uh, recommend to the board uh, the appointment of interim public health officer Sharon Reiser and Sharon I won't ask you to 
to speak to the board, but just stand uh, so they know they can put a face with a name. Uh, so Sharon will, if you concur with this appointment, she'll, she'll be uh, in that capacity and, uh, for the future until we have an appointment made. Uh, so the, the appointment is up to the board. I need a motion to approve. Supervisor Miller, second. Supervisor Coulter, any discussion? See no discussion. We have a motion and a second on the floor, I think. Yep. So we're ready to vote. And that was all yeses. Thank you. Congratulations. And we will move forward to our annual department reports and we'll start out with the circuit court judges, court commissioners, registers, and probate and annual department report. Any chance we get one of these in the courtroom so we can just say here the decision we just have to <laughs> um, my name is Ed Black. I'm one of the judges in St. Croix County. And when we give the reports, we often say, here's the status of the courts. And I told Judge Ian and Judge Waterman here today, I'm going to take this from a different point of view. I look at this as a time to reflect. I started practicing law in Hudson in 1974. So when I look around the room, if I'm not looking in your eyes, I apologize. I'm looking at the color of your hair. Uh, because I've been here for a lot of years. And in 1974, when I came here, we had a county courthouse on 4th Street. We had a county judge and a part-time circuit judge. And the types of cases they were handling were these types of cases. Divorces, auto accidents, and in criminal cases, theft of skis from Birch Park and Snowcrest, burglaries, marijuana, drunk driving, domestic, thoughts, domestic assaults. In the late 1970s, every county judge in the state became a circuit judge. So then we now had two full-time circuit judges. And again, courthouse was in 4th Street. Types of cases remained. Divorces, auto accidents, theft of skis, burglaries, marijuana, drunk driving, domestic assaults. 1980s, we had a beginning of a lot of phenomenal growth in our county. And the caseloads increased. Um, we had, we're still handling divorces, auto accidents, thefts, marijuana, drunk driving, domestic assaults. The state required mediation in child custody cases, which assisted us as judges and also the court commissioners and specifically the family court commissioner because we were doing a lot of child custody cases. And the mediation helped a lot of that numbers go down. 1980s, 1990s, I should say, and in the 1980s, it was obvious a third judge was needed. End of 1980s and beginning of 1990s, Judge Lundell and Judge Richards presided over a phenomenal number of civil jury trials among criminal jury trials. They then started a mediation system for civil cases that dramatically in decreased the number of civil jury trials. 1990s, continued growth. Number of cases, again, grew. Changes, new government center. That gave us enough room for a third judge. We then had a third judge, third branch, preside over Judge Needham. I talked to him this afternoon and I said, you know, he's the only judge who's presided over the third branch. So congratulations, Judge Needham. Okay. And he's not very old. Well, it's, so look at his hair color. But other things that happened in the 1990s, internet. We then had computerization of our cases in the circuit court called CCAP. A drug called methamphetamine started coming from the west to our county. The cases we were handling, again, divorces, auto accidents, in the criminal area, thefts in general, burglaries, meth cases, drunk driving, domestic assaults. The first decade of this century, continued growth. By 2005, it was clear we needed to do something about meth. Uh, some of you may remember um, Dave McQuillan, assistant DA. His efforts alone got Sulafed off the shelves in the stores in this state. Uh, but by 2005, we discussed a drug court that was created in, in April 2006. 2008, we had the fourth judge, 
Judge Waterman now presides over Branch 4. We had a severe financial crisis. Types of cases we're handling in the 80s, or in the first century. Divorces, but more child support enforcement. I'll get to that in a minute. Auto accidents, mortgage foreclosures, thefts, burglaries, many related to drug cases, meth cases, internet-related crimes, drunk driving, domestic assaults. The last eight years, the cases we've handled continue to be divorces, but again, more child support enforcement cases, auto accidents, mortgage foreclosures, thefts and burglaries, again, many related to drug use, meth cases, internet-related crimes, sexual assault cases, drunk driving, domestic assaults. 2010, we created the Juvenile Treatment Court. That was in place till 2016. We had a dramatic increase in mortgage foreclosures. Judge Cameron oversaw a mediation program for foreclosure cases. We had the creation of the Community Justice Collaborating Council, and I know Mr. O'Keefe is here to talk about that. Judge Lindell presides over that. 2016, I retired from presiding over the drug court, or the treatment court now. Judge Waterman presides over that. There's some threads here. Our work as judges never goes away. As I freaking tell people, you know, I'm never going to run out of work. Sad to say. Um, as judges, we still have to do our day-to-day -day work. We have our day-to-day -day calendars. We have to do that. Decisions. We make decisions, and we don't care which way the political winds blow. We make our decisions based upon the law and the facts. But we also have judges have to be creative to deal with the cases that we see. Couple threads. Drunk driving. Judge Waterman will just talk to you, I believe, in a few minutes about the OWI track and the treatment court. Domestic assaults. Mr. O'Keefe, about three years ago, said, you know, Judge Black, do you remember the presentation we made sometime in 1990 about domestic assaults? I don't remember. He had the article. That's been a passion of mine. As a culture, as a society, why do we put up with that? So, 2016, the state asked Judge Needham, our chief judge, would you please consider having St. Craig County become a model domestic violence court? Judge Needham said yes. He had too many duties to do as chief judge. Gave me the football, I took it. As part of the Community Justice Collaborating Council, we have a subcommittee, it's the Domestic Violence and Family Court Issues. I want to commend them in public, the work they've done towards the creation of this domestic violence court. And I announced at our last meeting that I intend to have this in place by October 1st. I intend to preside over this for at least two years. Now, for those of you who keep track, that means I intend to run again next year. But uh, just to let you know, and forewarn you maybe, but um, I've also discussed with child support about a child support enforcement court. I don't know how many thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars you understand are not paid. That's another pet peeve of mine. That's a day for another discussion. But I publicly want to thank, our, on behalf of all the judges, our judicial assistants, our staffs, clerk of court, registered and probate court commissioners, and their staffs. We are a separate branch of government, but we rely on you for funding for part of our funding. And we appreciate the support you give us. And um, please feel free to stop upstairs anytime you have questions. Um, last thought, the invocation, a couple of things stood out. The word service, and I thought, you know, we are public servants. And you know, people wonder, you actually run for this? Well, <laughs> but think about that. You know, how many times do you actually think about what you do? I mean, I saw the presentation about the audit, and I thought, you have to keep up with all this stuff. And that's pretty, that's a fantastic accomplishment. And yet at the same time, this body takes the time to publicly thank a servant for the county. We're pretty lucky. So again, thank you for your support. If you have any questions, please stop up. Judge Waterman. Thank you, everyone. I'm Judge Michael Waterman. I preside over the uh, treatment court. I'll just uh, share a few words about what we're doing and uh, what we're going to be doing in the future. So the uh, treatment court provides services for people who are in the criminal justice system who are diagnosed with a moderate to severe substance use disorder, in common parlance, a drug addiction or an alcohol addiction. And they are highly likely to reoffend, commit more crimes, usually more drug-related crimes. It's based on a national model that's uh, been proven to be successful, and it combines intensive outpatient treatment services through the Department of Health with 
heightened uh, supervision through the Department of Corrections, and frequent court contact so we can monitor their progress and hold them accountable. And when we see them, we're measuring for a number of different things. We want to make sure that they're passing their drug tests. Uh, they're subjected to upwards of three drug tests on a random basis weekly. We want to make sure that they're going to work or doing community service. They're required to do at least 30 hours of each. We want to make sure they're going to their treatment appointments because that's, after all, why they're there, is to get treatment. And we also want to make sure that they're doing pro-social sober activities. It could be AA, it could be NA, it could be Celebrate Recovery, it could be any number of things. We want them building up a support system to help them um, or to help support them when they graduate from the drug court or from the treatment court. Um, in our uh, budget materials, you'll find um, some charts uh, that show some of our numbers. Uh, I don't know if it's in your materials for tonight, uh, but we're very proud of uh, what the numbers are suggesting. Uh, compared to uh, probation and national drug court uh, results, our drug court is actually reducing some recidivism at a greater rate. So that people that graduate from our drug court are less likely to come back to court on new criminal charges in the future. And I think the success of the treatment court is more than just reduction in recidivism. We're also helping people reclaim their lives, live healthy and productive lives, have jobs, pay taxes, reunite them with families, keeping kids out of foster care. So there are a lot of collateral uh, benefits more than just reduction in crime. Uh, in the past year, we've been uh, looking to expand into alcohol. Because after methamphetamine, alcohol is probably the biggest problem that uh, we deal with in the uh, criminal justice system. And it wasn't long ago that Judge Black had a uh, trial with a man who had his seventh or his eighth uh, drunk driving. You know, and we're talking in the back hallway, and I just said, how does somebody get to their seventh OWI? And then after I started thinking about it, I knew the answer. At one point, he had a second offense and got 10 days in jail. At one point, he got a third offense and got 60 days in jail. He got his fourth offense and 120 days in jail. His fifth offense, probably a year in jail. But it continues. There's something about this particular offense with certain particular offenders that needs a higher level of intervention. Jail alone is not going to do it. The shock and the embarrassment that most of us would experience that would help us to self-correct, uh, these people do not have. So we are developing a, a second track for specifically alcohol uh, individuals, people with uh, an alcohol addiction. We're really targeting the high-level felony uh, OWI offenders, uh, fourths and upwards. And what we hope to do is to break this cycle so they're not coming back for their eighth, their ninth, and their tenth, uh, that they get the treatment that they need and that the recidivism ends. At the very least, what we expect is that through the monitoring that we're going to be doing in the drug testing, the time period that they're going to be in the program, there's an enhancement to public safety. At least we can be assured that this person is not going to be out there uh, driving while intoxicated on our roads. And if they do, if they do something like that, if they do relapse and drink alcohol, there are uh, mechanisms in place that can uh, be swiftly put in place to make sure that person gets off the road and doesn't harm our citizens. I'm always available if you have questions about drug court or treatment court. If you want to talk privately, I'm happy to do that, too. Uh, we are uh, celebrating a graduation. One of our participants has successfully completed treatment court and will graduate on September 12 at 9.30. So if you'd like to see uh, what drug court's all about, that's probably a good place to get an introduction. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Good evening. Steve Dunlap is my name, and I'm the uh, family court commissioner here in St. Croix County. And uh, one of the things that Judge Black said, was the first judges were handling were divorces. And then it got to be the next time, and it was divorces. And uh, it always was, it's not divorces anymore. More of our children being born are born to couples that aren't married. and when they separate, there's the same issue coming up. And so basically what I'm doing in St. Croix County is when parents separate and they can't figure out where the child is going to go to school, 
then they come in and ask the court to intervene and make those kind of decisions that parents are supposed to be making but uh, can't. And so before it gets to the circuit judges, uh, the first hearings are in front of, uh, in front of me. And uh, once the judges make the final decision, unfortunately, in family cases, there are always, not always, lots of times there are problems after the final hearing. I had a case uh, this afternoon. 17-year-old young lady decided that she wasn't going to see her father anymore. And the order of the court from five years ago was that the father was going to have shared placement with his children. One, one child was 20 already. And so he files a contempt matter against the mother to enforce the judgment from five years ago, saying that he has shared placement. And uh, unfortunately, it, it sounded to me like, look, it, talk to the mother, talk to the father, talk to this 17-year-old, find out what's going on and why she doesn't want to see her dad. So I appointed a guardian ad litem. Each parent had to pay $500 or it's going to be more. So we had another hearing today. Guardian ad litem made the recommendation for counsel because the daughter needed to say something to her dad that she couldn't say otherwise. Dad, after three months, decides that he's not interested in counseling and he only brought the order to show cause against mom because mom's been a jerk for 20 some years. You know. um, it doesn't end, unfortunately. And so after the divorce judgment, I hear many cases concerning the contempts. And uh, I'm also hearing a lot of child support cases now. And uh, our county is, is involved in that. So the child support office comes over and schedules these hearings. Now, I've been doing family law as long as Judge Flack has been around. And uh, I enjoy my work. Uh, and I want to thank you as the board for supporting my office and the work that we do there. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, it's something about families that once, uh, when I first started work, John Haywood was the family court commissioner. And I had a hearing in front of John, and he said to me, Steve, you know the three worst cases that lawyers take and lawyers have? They're family cases, boundary disputes, and will contests. And you know why that is? And I said, uh, Mr. Haywood, I, I don't. He said, in order to hate somebody, you got to know them a little bit. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, um, I think the way we want to go with families a lot of times is, in this case, it's not so much counseling for the children, but counseling for the parents to understand how to communicate with each other, how to talk to each other, how to listen to each other. And that's one of the ways one of the things that we're doing more of is instead of ordering counseling for children, ordering the parents to sit down and learn how to talk. I put a letter in your packet of how I get to be where I'm at. It's because the judges appoint me on an annual basis. But uh, I, think, uh, I think we are serving St. Croix County uh, well. If uh, you ever want to come up and watch one of these uh, hearings, feel free to do so. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Nothing else. We'll move on to the CJCC annual report. Michael Keith. 
Thank you. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael Keefe. Uh, I've been doing this job for just about five years. Uh, it's probably been the most interesting job I've ever had, trying to herd kittens. Um, but I'd like to just simply say that uh, I would like to invite all of you to some of our meetings. I think that we recently we had Supervisor Bosterling attend one of our domestic violence meetings, and I think he got a flavor for what we do, or what we attempt to do. Uh, we're trying to make changes, although they're incremental in our criminal community justice system. I really want to focus, though, on our system as being a community-based system, uh, that we're open to the public. All of our meetings are posted. All of our committees, subcommittees are posted, and due notice is given. So anytime you'd like to come, um, if you have questions, I think uh, Supervisor Fossling would attest that uh, he got a pretty good dose of what we do. It turned to budget issues there for a minute. Uh, we had a few community people, and I think he was looking for the door at that point. but. Uh, it, it, I think the meeting went well, and I would just invite you to please come and attend our meetings. Our next meeting is on September 13th on Thursday, and please come and just see what we do. If you have questions, feel, feel free to ask me. Thank you. No questions. Thanks, Mike. Our third one was uh, Clerk of Circuit Court, but Christy couldn't make it this evening that the report was in the packet, so she was, couldn't make tonight. We'll move on to the administrator's report on financial. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the board, the financial report is in the packet uh, representing financial activity through the end of July 2018. Uh, revenues and expenditures uh, for each of the five uh, standing committees in those departments that those committees uh, have uh, policy oversight. Total revenues, uh, budgeted revenues of 96.6 million uh, for fiscal year 18. Uh, year to date, revenues are a little over 62 million, uh, representing 37, 35.7% remaining uh, revenues to be collected. And then total expenditures, 98.3 million uh, for fiscal year 18. And year-to-date expenditures uh, for fiscal year 18, 52.6 million. Uh, so there's 46.5 percent remaining uh, for expenditures. And then also in your packet, you have a, a status report of the capital improvement uh, plan, which was approved by the board, showing all the projects and the uh, year-to-date expenditures for those projects. So if there are no questions, uh, I'd like to thank you. Any questions on the report? Supervisor Long. Are we any closer to uh, getting a report without a lot of the <clears throat> funky numbers, if that's uh, an accurate term? I think we're pretty uh, funky-less. Um, these reports have been uh, looked at by a subcommittee of the, the uh, board, uh, some of the admin committee members. We took several of their suggestions. Uh, the financial system uh, that we're currently working on is new. Um, so there will be, especially when we start working on the, or, and presenting the 2019 budget, uh, there's, you know, we're, we're in a transition year, um, so some of the prior year numbers and even some of the year-to-date numbers, uh, they're, as, they're as good as Ken Witt can make them be uh, in the finance department, but uh, there, it, this, this report is very close to being, uh, I don't want to say perfect, but as close as we can be at this point. So I think it, we've taken feedback from the county board supervisors and have tried to make these reports uh, meaningful to you. And, uh, but like I say, if you have ongoing suggestions uh, to try to help improve, get them to me or can, and we'll take it, take it from there. Yeah, Ken, did you have any, anything else you wanted to add? No? Okay. Any other questions? If not, we'll move on. Thank you. We'll go to our business items for tonight. 
The first one is the resolution to adopt the St. Croix County 2018-2028 Land and Water Resource Management Plan. And I need a motion on that, Supervisor Peavy. Yeah, I had a, a discussion this morning with the St. Croix County Unit of the Farm Bureau, and they asked if I could uh, have this postponed for a month. They haven't had time to to review it and get back. They would like to establish a committee out of the Farm Bureau. Uh, so I would move, and I don't know if this is appropriate, you'd have to help me, Mr. Larson. I would move we postpone this for one month to allow input from the St. Croix County Unit of Farm Bureau. It's not on the Do I have a second to that? What? You have to have it on the floor before you can postpone it. Oh, okay. I have to motion to approve it. Supervisor Hanson. Second? I need a second. Supervisor Bautatum. Any discussion? Supervisor so, I will repeat, I would move, I'm not going to repeat my previous comment. I would move we postpone this for one month to allow uh, the St. Croix um, agriculture community to review this uh, document and get back to us for uh, action at that time. Okay, do I have a Supervisor Peterson second that? Any discussion? Supervisor Hansen. This plan did not happen in a vacuum. Uh, in, in fact, it's been approved by the Department of Agriculture in Madison. Uh, there, it was a, a very well-developed and involved public process which involved the agricultural community. Uh, we had, we had several public meetings which were well attended and well advertised throughout the course of what period of time, Ellen? Uh, this started way back in February, and went from actually January, February, March, April. So we've been working on this for uh, nine months, and, and there have been many, many opportunities uh, to review and to make comments on this plan. Um, postponing at this point seems, uh, I don't know, it seems capricious. And I would ask you to go ahead and approve the plan if, if you've had a chance to read it. I think you'll appreciate the work that's gone into it. Any other comments or questions? If not, we'll vote on the postponing for one month. Ready to vote. For no the rest, yes, so it passed it a postpone one month. Thank you. The next one is the resolution amending rules and bylaws adding consent agenda items. Do I have a motion to approve that? Supervisor Osnes, do I have a second? Supervisor Motatum. Are there any questions on that? Supervisor Osnes. This item uh, comes in front of you at the suggestion of uh, Supervisor Fiedler at the last meeting, um, asked if the board would consider um, to, in an effort to make our meetings a bit more efficient, that certain items be considered for inclusion in the consent agenda. Uh, so the admini uh, Committee on Administration took this issue up at their last meeting and the, uh, the action item in front of you is a resolution which would amend the rules and bylaws of the board to include three additional items uh, under the uh, consent agenda, and those would be the appointments, uh, secondly, the approval of amendments to town zoning ordinances. These are uh, recommendations coming in front of the board from the town boards 
uh, for recommended zoning approvals and usually are um, fairly uh, perfunctory and administrative in nature and the board typically has very little uh, issues with these. So it was the committee's recommendation that we include that item. And then lastly, any other item deemed routine by the county board chair. So it gives the chair a little bit of flexibility uh, when we're putting these monthly agendas together. If, if an item comes up that he feels appropriate for the consent agenda, he would uh, make that recommendation to the clerk. Um, at any point in the, in the past and in the future, if the board, uh, at the beginning of the meeting, if you feel there is an, an item on the consent agenda that you would like to have removed for special consideration and action, the board still has that right. So that hasn't changed. Uh, so this was the committee's recommendation. Uh, in, in the future, if there's other suggestions or if there's a suggestion tonight, uh, to amend this to include something else or to take something off. It's up to the board, but this was the committee's best effort to address uh, uh, a very legitimate concern raised by one of our board members. Thank you. Any questions or discussion? Not seeing any. We have a motion and a second. We'll vote on that. So yeses, thank you. The last one is the resolution regarding the lack of funding for Wisconsin transportation system, urging the governor and the legislator to just fix it. A motion, Supervisor Peterson, second, Supervisor Peavy. Any discussion? Supervisor Nordstrand. When I saw this resolution, I did a little research to find out where it came from, because I didn't honestly think it had been originated in a committee of our board. And it turns out it was sent by the Wisconsin Counties Association with a fairly terse little note, we'd really like you to pass this so we can take this down to Madison during our lobbying efforts to, for the next lobbying season. Uh, maybe not season, I don't know what word they used, but the, that was the idea. Well, it was also suggested to me that this was, this resolution had already been passed by St. Croix County. And so I did a little research. And it turns out that in 2016, just about two years ago, we passed this same resolution, almost word for word. The actual last sentence, other than a couple of words, is identical to what we already passed on to the governor and the legislature two years ago. Now, I get it that, you know, it's a new board and there's a few new legislators, there's the same governor, but at least for now, right? Uh, but the point is, what is the point? Uh, I, I, and then if you look at the actual what we're urging. I mean, well, let me start here. Does anybody in this room know if states surrounding Wisconsin and across the country have stepped up with sustainable funding plans for their state and local roads? What does that mean? Who knows that? Is there somebody on our county board that can attest to this? Wisconsin will be at a competitive disadvantage. Levy limits do not allow government to make up for the deterioration of state funding. Locals, including St. Croix County, continue to struggle to meet even the most basic maintenance needs for our transportation system. Is that what our highway commissioner really thinks about St. Croix County roads? I mean, these are things that we are saying as a board are true today, tonight. Local governments would not be forced to turn local wheel, to local wheel taxes or increased borrowing or exceeding their levy limits if the state would finally pass a sustainable funding plan for transportation. Then at the end, here's what we ask for. This is the ask. I mean, all that other stuff is just, I don't know, a point of view, a political point of view, frankly. 
And so here the St. Croix County Board urges the governor and legislature, and this is what we said two years ago, to agree upon a sustainable solution. Oh boy, that's a good idea. One that includes a responsible level of bonding, borrowing money, and adjusts our user fees to adequately and sustainably fund the Wisconsin transportation system raise our gas taxes and our fees associated with cars and trucks, et cetera. So that's what we're asking. Just so everybody knows, I think that this kind of a message is not helpful. I mean, it didn't work, right? I mean, we have the same whereas clauses from two years ago that we have right now. So apparently, this resolution and all the same resolutions that the Wisconsin Counties Association had all the different counties pass had essentially no effect. Witness the exact same problems listed in the whereas clauses. So I would suggest that we take a stand here and now and say we don't want to pass any more resolutions that have whereas clauses that we don't know about, we can't back up, that are political in nature, argumentative in nature, and that when we don't actually ask for th something that's substantive at the end, and oh, by the way, we already did it. So I would urge everybody to just say no to this resolution, and let's, why don't we write one ourselves if we really think this is important? I mean, the Transportation Committee could sit down and write a resolution about St. Croix County problems and ask the legislature and the governor for something substantive that we need. And we've got eight, I think, eight state representatives that represent this county. Maybe we could get something done. So that's all I got. Any other discussion? Supervisor Long? Yeah, there's a couple other issues, too. <clears throat> uh, one of the things, you know, we're basically seeing in this resolution is, okay, let's, let's increase user fees uh, and uh, do some responsible bonding. Well, one of the things we have no idea, we have no um, assurance that those increased taxes, basically, are going to come back to St. Croix County. Are they going to go to projects to in Madison or Milwaukee or Eau Claire? So basically, we have, have the potential for having a situation that we're increasing our taxes on our citizens in our county, and we're not getting any benefit from it. So the piece that's missing from this resolution or this whole issue is the resource allocation. How are we going to make sure that if we agree to increase user fees and um, bonding, we're actually going to benefit from that here in St. Croix County. So I think that's a fundamental problem with this resolution. The other couple of things I could add, I know there are projects going on in the state. I just drove through one, I-90, from Madison to the Illinois border. It's a, it's a mess. They're completely rebuilding that interstate highway. So, and I spoke with um, Representative Staschel today, and he said that there are uh, numerous multi-billion dollar projects that are going on in the state, pretty major ones, that will probably be done in another two years, and that gives us the opportunity at that point to then start reallocating some of those resources um, to our local county, making sure that we're benefiting in some of those um, resources. So the resolution really is kind of meaningless. I agree with uh, Supervisor Nordstrand. It, it, it's not going to do anything. So it's kind of a wasted effort, um, quite frankly. As much, as much as I agree we need to fix our roads, this isn't going to do it. Supervisor Foster Dane, yes. Yeah, just a comment. I, I, I agree, you know, this, these. Uh, resolutions are, are difficult because this is a complex issue and uh, um, and perhaps as, as we look at this thing here you know it's very difficult to know exactly you know where this is going uh, I did raise the question as to whether or not um, you know this comes up with a, a, a specific solution and the answer was no um, 
Wisconsin does pay about uh, 4.3 cents, I think it is, more than Minnesota. In fact, we're higher than Iowa and the Dakotas also. So we pay a higher um, gas tax. Um, I think in terms of competitiveness, you know, for our county, maybe the issue really is, is that we need to reduce our gas tax so that, um, you know, we aren't uh, um, non-competitive, you know, in terms of our businesses here. People are buying their taxes someplace else, maybe actually in, in the end it results in us getting less revenue because of the fact that people are developing habits of buying their gas, gas someplace else where it's cheaper. So overall, I think, you know, it is complex, you know, how, what is the best resolution uh, for this? I know that, you know, years gone by, um, the taxes, uh, Wisconsin's uh, gas tax has been one of the highest in the nation until uh, the recent uh, uh, administration, which kind of held it um, pretty close, pretty flat. And uh, uh, that's kind of helped in, to a great extent because the, the fund was rated in the past by, of, of up to uh, $1.4 billion because there just was too much money in there. So uh, um, I don't know, you know necessarily what the answer is, but you know, we do have, uh, um, you know, we do have an issue here. I think that the current uh, administration is, is addressing it and has done a great job with it. And uh, uh, so I'm not sure exactly either, you know, in terms of, of where this goes, but you know, we need a solution. Um, Perhaps this is not the best wording. We'll have our, see if Robbie can come up and talk with our highway commissioner on this subject. He, I think he got up back there. He was asked a question and we'll let him respond. I guess I'll try to reply to a couple of the questions that were out there. One was the cost to drive. Um, there's a, there's a good, memo out there on the cost to drive. Wisconsin is actually one of the lowest states on cost to drive. This includes both um, fuel tax consumption as well as registration fees. Um, we're at about $304. This is based on 2016 WIST study. Uh, Minnesota's at 523, Iowa's at 493, Illinois's at 463, and Michigan's at 386. Um, to respond to their question on the other local states, I think what they're referring to is both uh, Michigan, uh, Indiana, um, I believe Iowa, have done fuel tax increases in the last year. I'm just proposing on that one. This was a memo that was sent out by the WCA. It is also supported by the WCHA, which is the Wisconsin County Highways Association. I'm um, just trying to provide those background facts. Did I miss any other questions possibly that I could answer um, as far as some of the other thing that was brought up? Um, our GTA, if you're, if you're ever interested in that, which is general transportation aids in 2011. Uh, from 2011 to 2017, we've seen about a 4.5% increase overall over those eight years. Um, meanwhile, some of our materials have been a challenge. So our costs are rising. Um, I can't reiterate that enough. So those are the things that are out there. Um, I'm just trying to answer any questions that you have. If you have any other ones, I'd try to help as I can. Well, maybe just, you know, a question of a clarification or, uh, and maybe you could add more to it, but um, we do know that the gas taxes of Minnesota, Iowa, the Dakotas and so forth are lower, you know, than Wisconsin. So if we just um, thought in terms of gas tax, it would be cheaper, but their, their registration is higher there. And uh, so it really comes down to what is the assumed amount of miles that are driven, you know, by the, uh, um, you know, by the citizens, you know, of the state. And of course, you know, we're in a situation where we've got a lot of commuters, you know, going in. So our miles driven probably is higher, you know, so if we thought just in terms of, of uh, St. Croix. But, you know, you, the, the point is, is well taken that the gas tax is essentially, uh, you know, a flat amount. It's not uh, inflation adjusted. So, you know, there needs to be solutions, you know, for it and whether or not, you know, there should be, um, you know, uh, the, the next step should be more emphasis on the, uh, the registration versus, you know, the tax, uh, the gas tax because of, uh, you know, a more fuel efficient vehicles or whatever, then, you know, that's, that's a good question, you know, for the legislature to answer. And, and I don't know what the answer is, you know, off, off, off hand, but, uh, um, you know, it definitely is a, is a complex issue. And, uh, um, so I, I, I'm not sure, you know, we're necessarily getting at it right here, but, uh, you know, your point is well made. 
And if the county board desires, I can send out some of this information at your request as far as um, if there's a desire for that follow-up information. So, President Nordstrand. So is it your position that St. Croix County struggles to meet even the most basic maintenance needs for our transportation system? I would uh, say this, that in 2008 when St. Croix County um, enacted their vehicle registration fee to supplement their transportation funds, they, were, they took a step in a, a very good direction in funding their transportation system. They took a responsible step. A lot of counties aren't in similar situations, even in places that I've worked previously, that have uh, turned to bonding to fund a large portion of their transportation system. We would be in a much different picture if we hadn't supplemented the funding or had another funding source in 2008. I can tell you that right now the average road expectancy life in St. Croix County is over 30 years. Now that's for a traditional hot mix pavement, hot mix asphalt roadway. Traditionally, um, we look at a 25 year life cycle on those roadways. That would be optimum. And within that 25 year life cycle, we look at one resurfacing and one mill and overlay. So that being said, we have taken and we will continue to take every method we can to try to extend the useful life of our roadways within St. Croix County. We will look at any avenue, and we have. Um, this year, if you've seen some different pavement types and different surface treatments, we've looked at fog sealing. We're looking at any way possible to extend that useful life. The highway department will continue to strive to provide as best maintenance at as low as cost as we can. Um, but salt has increased. Um, we've seen salt costs go up by over 100% in the past 10 years. So these are the kind of challenges that we're facing. And I think the intent of the WCA, the WCHA, if I'm going to guess the intent, was to drive at some of those inflationary costs that are really starting um, to hit home. But this particular resolution, and I saw what was sent from the WCHA, had a nice blank here. So it was basically telling every county in Wisconsin that, oh, by the way, you are struggling to meet even the most basic needs for your transportation system. I mean, no thought was put into this as to whether or not Dane County is different than St. Croix is different than Polk or anybody else. It was just cookie cutter, you know, here's our argument, and we're going to make it whether it's true or not. I mean, it doesn't sound to me like we're struggling to meet the most basic transportation needs. Is that correct? I you know, we're plowing our roads and we're, we're doing as best we can. I guess I'm not, you know, the most basic needs is a, we're back to this as a, as a cookie cutter to a certain extent. And they, they do, do like consistency between the counties on these resolutions. That's their intent. Supervisor Hanson. I, would, I think it's important to point out that the Wisconsin Counties Association is, among other things, a big role that they play is a lobbying organization. We pay a lot of money in, in dues to that to that organization. Uh, we're we're one of uh, we are an active we have an active role in the Wisconsin County Highways Association uh, as a leader is playing a leadership role. Um, we help set their agenda. We we're not doing we're not doing um, that kind of work. Uh, because we because we don't know what's going on. It's not a blank. It's not nebulous. Um, we are not paving and resurfacing enough road miles to keep up with the need on the 25-year uh, cycle of life of our highways. So every year we go backwards by a small percentage, but every year we get farther away from what we're going to need when the roads begin to need to be absolutely replaced. So we do what we can is the phrase that you hear. It's always kind of Pollyanna-ish. If we don't find a better funding source, we're going to have the people who sit in these seats in 15, 20, 25 years are going to wonder why we didn't do something better. It wasn't very many years ago it was a Democratic governor who decided to take the state highway transportation fund and gut it so that he could balance the budget. So this isn't just because we, it's not political. It's because it's convenient. And we need to stand up and say, hey, state government, quit kicking this down the road because you're hurting us. We have to say something. So our lobbyist has asked us to help them help us. 
So you don't like the wording? Okay, write a new one. You're a good lawyer. Help us. Help us. Help them. It would be useful. I, I think it's good to send a strong message to the legislature. So uh, if we can't vote for this one, let's set her on the table. Supervisor Coulter, you had something you want to say? No. Supervisor Peavy? I just wanted to make a, 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 a real simple example. Um, local government, levy limit. I'm on town board, town of Galley. We have 50 miles ruled. They last 25 years. So that means we should replace two miles every year. Because the levy limit, we can replace one. So a couple example. Every year we go back one mile. Simple example, local, as local as it can be, and the levy limit stops us from actually spending the money that we would actually need to keep up. Nothing to do with state gas tax, the town roads are all town funded or 90%. But that's one example I just wanted to use. Yes, I agree with that. Um, maybe the wording isn't quite right on this, but we need to keep pressure on our legislators to, to change something. Our, our road system in Wisconsin, and especially in the, in the towns for sure, are, are, we're going way backwards. It's, it's, something's got to change. And I think we need to keep pressure on whether this is the right wording or not. I don't know. Any other discussion? Supervisor Anderson. And I would agree with uh, Supervisor Schachner and PV's uh, town of Hammond. We have 65 miles of roads, and we should do three miles a year. We're doing one right now. We're going to have a vote on next Monday at town to increase the levy of 300,000 so we can do two miles. Our roads are in bad shape, and we are capped at an amount that we can spend on. So. Any other discussion? That's well, the, just ask a we have a motion uh, second on the floor. Oops, yeah, please, a question. Yeah, uh, Scott, I just, I just want to raise a question for you, and that is, would you, would you feel like you could write a better um, resolution on this, and would you be willing to do that? Wait a minute. I think I could. I mean, I, then I, then I think I we could certainly do better than a cookie yeah. cutter from the Wisconsin Counties Association that has to do with the issues that we have. I mean, you raised the issue of the levy limit. We didn't bother to ask them to do something about the levy limit. If that's, you know, that's a good question. Is there anything that can be done? Because that's a different than asking the state to borrow and asking the state to raise the gas tax. That's another option that isn't on the table. I don't know why the counties association isn't doesn't talk about that, but that would be another subject. Supervisor Holder. Yeah, let's be clear about something though. The local voters can do something about the levy limit, so it's not imposed by the state on the local voters. The local voters, if they want to pave three miles a year instead of one, they can vote to raise the money to do that. So, well. Any other just Fred Dr. Roth? Can't we do both? I mean, we have points that, you know, we pay dues for this group to help the counties in passing this resolution, but I also agree. Maybe we should write another one for St. Croix County that will hit on areas that are specific to counties that are not included in this. It can't hurt to pass this, and it could help. But I also agree we should do, it'd be nice if St. Croix County was a first coming out with a unique resolution that actually hit on the problems instead of cookie cutting it. Okay, Supervisor Coulter. Yeah, one of the things I notice is that when I go to Minnesota, which I try to avoid, is that we, have, we pay 4.3 cents per gallon more on gas tax and yet gas is about a dime cheaper over their average from what I spot. And I don't know if the minimum markup bill has something to do with that. If we got rid of the minimum markup, uh, gas might be more competitive in our local dealers and more people would buy it in Hudson instead of buying their gas in Minnesota when they visit there. And uh, that might contribute more to this solving this issue than anything else that we're talking about. And uh, the other thing that I'd mention is that 
that uh, we're always talking about borrowing spending and borrowing more and raising taxes. And I don't think from my circulation with my voters that anybody feels undertaxed. So. Okay. Well, we have a motion and a second on the floor and we've had a lot of discussion, so I think it's uh, time to vote at this time. Um, now, the, the, the motion is, is to adapt the resolution right here. Excuse uh, me? The, your, the motion is on the particular resolution, this one right It's here. on the floor okay. right now. So could I uh, propose an alternative uh, resolution that we appoint a committee to... Um, you want to, to amend the motion? Yes, I'd like to present a, a, a motion okay. to um, rewrite this resolution by our own committee uh, appointed by yourself, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think maybe what you want to do is make a motion to refer back to committee. Yeah. I don't, yeah. and. I'll, I'll accept that. Okay. <laughs> and do I have a second to that? To ref Supervisor Long second that? Okay, we have a. To the transportation committee. You want to refer? Transport. Okay, so we have a recommended motion on the floor to send it back to committee. What? I came out of administration. It went through transportation as well. I mean, according to their records. Refer it back to. Go to the originating committee, which would be so transportation. Well, it would be referred back to transportation committee then. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. So there was a motion to refer it back to highway in a second. So at this time, we will vote on this recommendation to send it back to committee. Three no's, the rest yes, so it passes. It'll go back to the Transportation Committee to rewrite that resolution. Thank you. Now we're open for future agenda items. Unless there's other complications which have happened multiple times, the libraries of St. Croix County would like to make their presentation next month in October oh, okay. as on the agenda. Yep. Okay. Any other agenda items? If not, uh, county clerk's report. What, nothing? Cindy doesn't have anything. Announcements, anybody? Supervisor Peavy? For those that are interested, highway department is getting salt ready for winter, so it's coming. <laughs> okay. Any other announcements? Supervisor Long? Is it possible to get a quick update on District 13? The court rendered a decision today. It remanded the matter back to the board with, with specific instructions, including to discard the quote unquote Shirley ballot and, re and do the recount procedure over as to each ward. Professor Hansen. Well, that's awful to have to follow. I wanted to invite you. Okay, you all received an invitation to the, the, the Suicide Prevention and Awareness Forum in, in New Richmond. There are several county employees who are involved with this, the uh, United Way uh, and the VFW, and I'm going to be on the panel. Not only that, this is on my birthday, so please come to this function, it's going to be a great community discussion, help end the stigma that goes along with mental illness. I would appreciate to see you there. I have one announcement here. I believe all the county board members got this in there. We e emailed this is that uh, WITC is seeking qualified candidates to serve on the WITC board. So I would hope that everybody take a close look at that and see if they come up with a candidate. So we can move forward. Supervisor 
Yep, Roger, to clarify on that, that we're, that's looking for uh, a female employer, right? Yes. Yeah, so it has those two, two criteria. Yep. Supervisor your hands. If, if you, even if you don't want to come, take this little poster and put it up someplace, you know, church or school or, or city hall. I'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Any other announcements? Not seeing anybody? We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>